I was just asking how to uh, move the slides on this laptop. Um, if I understood the mayor correctly, <laughs> I've been asked to speak about the bedrooms of America. Uh, but I, I, I didn't prepare. And I have this other slideshow here. And I, uh, we're, so we're going to have to talk about human rights. But um, uh, Tony is an amazing guy. I just, Tony, you, I love you, Tony. I, uh, I really, really like Coeur d'Alene, and, and, and I like this whole section of Idaho. Um, what amazing people. You're just, you're, I, I come here and I just, I get uplifted. It just, it stays with me for years. It's such an extraordinary community. And the courage that all of you had, and there's so many leaders in this room, the courage that all of you had to stand up to the Aryan Nation's message and to win. And uh, 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 as I was saying earlier today to some people, I, I was a latecomer. The, the work was done for 20 years before I ever came here. And uh, it was, it was uh, uh, I was a follower and, and, and many, many of you uh, were the leaders. Um, so I'm just grateful to, to have been a part of this and to have made friends and to have learned from all of you. Um, I, um, uh, tonight I've prepared a, a, a few thoughts and I've got a few slides. I, um, it, it was seven years ago, it was almost seven years ago this month in 2001 when we had a banquet. I, I don't know, was it in this same room probably? And, and we were celebrating uh, the transfer of the Aryan Nation's uh, compound to what became the Human Rights Education Institute. And uh, um, that was an incredible day. And Morris Dees was here, and I'll never forget it. Um, and it's been seven years, and coming back here, I've been here a couple times since then, but coming back tonight, it's a really great opportunity for me to think about human rights and to think about how my, my own understanding of human rights has grown during even those seven years. And what I wanted to do tonight was to, to think again about the original definition of human rights and, and to try to put it in the context of some uh, debates that are happening in this country right now. I've, I've been out of the country a lot in the past four years. I've been in Africa. Um, but what I see and what, and what I notice uh, is what, what people are calling a culture war. That there's just, there's a huge national debate going on. And, and some of it makes me a little bit sad. And you see, you turn on the TV and, and you see people uh, just yelling at each other. And, and a lot of civil discourse seems to have stopped. And, and uh, as, as everyone likes to talk about the red states and the blue states and how polarized the conversation is. And it's particularly confusing to me because I've lived about half my life in Idaho and I lived about half my life uh, back east in Boston and New York and other places. And I meet really great people in both places, in the so-called red states and the so-called blue states. I meet people that I respect. I meet people that, that are intelligent. I meet conservatives that are really impressive to me. I meet liberals that are really impressive to me. I meet people from both political parties and independents. And um, it's very difficult for me to understand then if, if this person is really smart and good and this person is really smart and good and they completely disagree with each other and they're screaming at each other, um, how does that make sense? And more importantly, how can the country come back together again? How can we come back to civil discourse and, and how can we find a common ground and feel like one country again? And so I, I've been looking uh, to human rights ideas 
an ideology to see um, if there were some answers there. Um, and asking myself, I mean, what, what is human rights? Is it, is it a liberal philosophy? Is it a conservative philosophy? Is it a bridge between the two? Where does it fit in the national debate? Is it still relevant? Is it part of the national debate? Um, this is what's on my mind and what I thought that I would talk about for a few minutes tonight. Um, let me see if I can work this. Okay, so, so this is a picture of Confucius. So that tells you how much how much history we're going to cover in about 15 minutes. Uh, Tony, I think Tony gave me 30 minutes, so, um, and I've already used about five. So um, really quick, let's just talk about where did human rights come from. Um, first of all, it's not a Western idea. It's an idea that sprouted throughout all of history over the past three, 4,000 years. And, 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 and the reason I put up a picture of Confucius is that even in China, uh, two and a half thousand years ago, when Confucius was alive, he had, a, he had a disciple named Mencius who was talking about human rights. And Confucius was kind of the law and order person, uh, the authority, and, and this guy Mencius was saying, ah, oh, yes, but what about the little guy? You know, even a, a single person could contradict an emperor if, if he or she were right. So that idea even started that long ago. Uh, this is, a, this, this is a, a, a picture of the Magna Carta. And uh, we all know what the Magna Carta is. It was uh, created in the 13th century uh, in England, right? And the Magna Carta was one of the first human rights documents. And uh, what happened was the king of England kept sending the country to war. And, 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 and the lords uh, got tired of that. And, and they said, oh, we're not gonna do this anymore. And we're going to make you sign a contract in which you share power uh, with the rest of us. Uh, so that was 700 years ago. And, and the Magna Carta is not perfect. It, it doesn't read like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or our Bill of Rights. It's, it's, uh, but it was a beginning. And even in that document, there was a mention of, of women's rights. There was a mention that women could inherit property, for instance. So it was the start of some of these ideas. Uh, there's a, the Declaration of Independence. So several more centuries goes by and you have philosophers in France and philosophers in England talking more about uh, human rights. The fundamental idea that it's not just about power in society. It's about law and it's about the idea uh, that every human being uh, has value and every human being has dignity, um, uh, not just the rich and not just the powerful. Uh, of course, the Declaration of Independence was one of the greatest documents uh, ever to express that view and to create our nation based upon that. But at about the same time, you had, um, let me go forward one, that, I don't know if you can see that, that's the French rights of man and the citizen. And that was at about the same time that in France, um, they were developing this same concept. Uh, and then we had our Bill of Rights. and. Uh, this was very really exciting that you had two nations now, the United States uh, and France, that both had the concept of rights for everybody and that every human being mattered. Uh, the only problem was most of the people in the world still didn't have these rights. It was, it was really uh, France, the United States, and to some extent, to a lesser extent in England, uh, that the concept of human rights was developed. Um, let's flash forward to uh, World War II. Uh, that is, of course, Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill. Uh, what happened uh, is in World War II, the horrors were so bad that the Allied nations said, uh, never again. And, and, and Franklin Roosevelt gave this, his amazing and famous Four Freedoms speech um, in 1942 when he said every human being on the planet uh, deserves their rights. Uh, not just if you're an American citizen or a French citizen or it doesn't matter what country you live in. If you're a human being, you deserve the basic rights. And that was quite a statement. And when Franklin Roosevelt said that, you have to understand that uh, the United States was 
the leading country among the allies winning World War II. He was, in some sense, seen as the most powerful person in the world. So he was in a position to make this statement and to have it really uh, affect everybody. Eleanor, uh, Franklin Roosevelt died and the World War II uh, ended and the United Nations was formed and, uh, and the United Nations decided to create a universal declaration of human rights. So we, we ha as Americans, we had the Bill of Rights, but the idea uh, uh, was to create a universal declaration of human rights uh, that would be for every citizen of the world. And Eleanor Roosevelt, the, the amazing and brilliant uh, spouse of Franklin Roosevelt, was chair of the commission. Um, and, and 18 nations were represented on this commission. It met for two years, from 1946 to 1948. And every kind of philosophy was represented. Uh, you, had, you had Catholics, you had Protestants, you had uh, Muslims, uh, you had uh, Marxists, uh, you had people from different parts of the world. Uh, you had a Chinese uh, scholar uh, who was actually vice chair of the commission, and, and these people met for two years and created the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, they asked everybody for their opinion, um, everybody they could think of. They said, what should be in a Universal Declaration of Human Rights? And they studied all the documents from history that they could find. Right at this time, Mahatma Gandhi was leading India to independence. So he was leading several hundred million Indians to, to, to their independence and to their human rights. The people of this commission, Eleanor Roosevelt, sent a letter to Mahatma Gandhi and said, um, what, what do you think should be in a Universal Declaration of Human Rights? And, and he wrote back, now this is a man who, if anybody in the world at that time was in a position to express a view, it was certainly him. Uh, I mean, we all know about his life. Uh, he, he lived uh, humbly. Uh, he, he lived with almost nothing. He ate out of a little rice bowl. And, and, and he was enduring violence in his nonviolent protests and leading hundreds of millions of Indians to their independence. So this is a person who, what do you think he said when they asked him what should be in a Universal Declaration of Human Rights? I mean, you can just imagine him pounding the table and, and, and saying, you know, every person deserves this or every person deserves that. And he, he certainly had every, every reason to do that. But he was a very brilliant man. And he anticipated the future. And he knew already that every possible right was going to show up in this Universal Declaration. He, he, there was no point for him to express views that were already going to be represented. And he wrote back and said something that, that nobody expected. He, he wrote back and said, well, I think in your declaration, don't just talk about rights, talk about responsibilities. Talk about the responsibility that every human has to give back to their society. And that became Article 29. Uh, everyone has duties to the community in which alone the free and full development of his personality is possible. Um, now Article 30 is mostly just a kind of a process article, so to speak. So in some ways Article 29 is the last content article of the Universal Declaration. So in other words, it's as if they put it right at the end to remind all of us. So after they've been talking about all the rights we have, at the very end they say, now remember, you got responsibilities to give back. I think that's extraordinarily brilliant and gifted and, and an important and core principle in the human rights movement. And for me, it's the beginning of finding the bridge between the big debate that we have in this country right now. Human rights is meant to be a minimum guarantee for all humans. It's, it's meant to be the, thing, the things that we all know about, uh, the right to a fair trial, the right to be able to vote, uh, the right to free speech, the rights that we know of in our t 10 amendments. The Universal Declaration expanded it to some other things like the right to primary uh, education and, and so forth. 
And many, and, 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 and billions of people in the world still don't have these basic rights. And we've got a lot of work to do. And there's people in this country, obviously, who don't have those basic rights. And we've got a lot of work to do. However, the purpose of human rights was not meant to create societies of selfish human beings. It wasn't meant to create a culture where people are saying, me, 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 I got my rights. Human rights isn't right to do anything or anything goes. It's, it's, it's meant to be a minimum guarantee so that every human has basic dignity, uh, but that we all remember to give back. And when I look at the current, let's, let's call it culture wars in this country, because some people use that term, that the current debate in this country, and I listen to both sides and I try to think, what are they, where's this coming from? And I listen to you know, good conservative people who are very concerned about where the country's heading and they say, you know, we're becoming a very selfish country and, and, and everybody's just trying to get rich and it's all about me and there's no more family values and so forth. And I say to myself, you know, they got a point. I can see that happening in some parts of America. Um, but then I listen to liberal voices or progressive voices and they say, they say, hey, we got a lot of work to do still. We got a lot of people in this country that don't have health care. We got, we got uh, people who are not getting uh, a right to a fair trial. We got people that are being left out of this extraordinary prosperity. And I listen to those two voices and I say, well, yeah, it is possible for both of them to be right. <laughs> this actually doesn't have to be a de debate where we're screaming at each other because guess what? Uh, I think Mahatma Gandhi anticipated this. He anticipated that that if a country becomes too wealthy and, you, and, and, and people get the wrong idea that human rights means you know, my right to do anything, that they're going to have to be reminded, no, 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 that's not what it was about. It's about giving back. It's about a minimum guarantee for everybody. Uh, but all of us who have so many privileges, it's about us giving back. It's about us seeing that everybody else has the basic minimum standards for dignity. And so for me, I find, I find the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to be a, 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 a brilliant and forward-thinking document that gives us a complete picture of a society where every human uh, uh, has a right to go to school, has health care, uh, has a free trial, is able to vote, uh, where, where, where there isn't discrimination. Um, but we don't become selfish, we don't become uh, uh, screaming all the time about our rights, but we're actually thinking about what we're giving back. And uh, as such, for me, I think, I think human rights is a very relevant conversation in our society today and could be a way for bringing um, the nation together. Um, what, I, what I wanna do now I guess, how many more minutes do I have? I got about six more minutes, Tony. So um, what I want to do now is really quick talk about why I'm in Africa. Um, and I think it fits with my previous conversation because um, what we have is um, I'm working in Mozambique. Uh, I'm working in a country that had war for 30 years uh, where the average lifespan is in the 30s. Uh, and people die of uh, all kinds of diseases or malnutrition. Um, and only about half children are in school of any kind. And people are um, mostly subsistence farmers. And when I first started going there four years ago, um, I started spending time in the jungle and living in a tent. I was really surprised about something. Everybody was happy. I said, wait a minute, I'm really confused. <laughs> you guys don't have anything. <laughs> but they're happy. The, these people have each other. They still have the community that we in the West are at risk of losing if we become too individualistic and, and too autonomous. Because they have so few resources, they have to rely on each other and it keeps them close and families are close and villages stay together and they care about each other. And you never, you're never lonely when you live in these villages and you're never wondering what your identity is or who you are. Um, and 
I, 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 at the time I was living in Boston, and this was really, you know, Boston's a very wealthy place. I was really puzzled. I was like, okay, everybody in rural Mozambique is happier than everybody in Boston. So something went wrong uh, on the way to 2,000 years of civilization. Uh, but I learned a lesson from that that I brought back to my understanding of human rights. And, and that, um, um, that as a society, um, we need to give back and we need to, to be paying attention to each other's needs and not just focusing on our own prosperity or our own rights, so to speak, phrased in that way. Um, we, uh, we and, and, and by the way, the Nature Conservancy is sitting over here, and I want to I wanna acknowledge them because one of the great debates is, is can you do human development and environmental protection at the same time? And a lot of people think that they are uh, antagonistic with each other. Um, and we're trying to do both at the same time um, in Africa. Um, and also, the Nature Conservancy said if I said their name in this meeting, they'd send a million dollars. You see, so um, what I'm really trying to do is to break even on my <laughs> Coeur d'Alene activities. But, uh, but seriously, we work, um, we work outside of a national park, and uh, we work to, with the local villagers to, uh, to plan the development of their land. And here's something I learned. They don't own their own land, and most poor people in the world don't. They don't have any land rights. Um, and so we work with them to register their land so that they can own it, so that they can develop it, and, and we help them with their farming. Uh, and that's what's happening in that picture. Um, and uh, that's me uh, when I don't have to wear a tie, and I'm talking to uh, villagers that live um, just outside this national park where we work. Uh, this is, okay, so. This is a typical subsistence uh, farm. It's about one acre, and this family will feed themselves for a year with no electricity, no refrigeration, no tractor, uh, no pest control. And you talk about being resourceful. Uh, it's amazing. They still, this is, this is how they make their bread, and it would have it looked that way 2,000 years ago. Um, this is my favorite photo. So in restoring this national park, uh, we're trying to create jobs in, in tourism and other, and other businesses. So this is graduation class from, ha from, uh, from a housekeeping class. So these are uh, mostly women, some men from the local village who just had three weeks of training on how to be a, a housekeeper in our tourist uh, camp. And um, we had graduation ceremony uh, and they got diplomas and they had graduation speakers and I was in the back of the room crying. Uh, but, um, but, now, but, but the point is that they have dignity now. They have a job and they can plan their future and they will live longer than 35 years old because they'll be able to afford health care. So, so this is what I think of when I think of basic human rights. Right to have a job, right to have health care, uh, right to own your land. And then, and this is what happens as soon as they get a job. They go back to their community and they start businesses. This is a little market that started uh, in a community where there was nothing. Uh, we build them a school. That's now all painted and finished. There's 550 kids in there. Before, um, their school was a tree uh, with, a, with a blackboard. And now, um, and that's a health clinic that we built. That's, that's me, by the way, praying with the local spiritual leader. And we're very respectful of their traditions. Uh, the last thing I want to do is bring them all the bad ideas from our culture. So, so we, uh, we're very respectful of their culture, which is amazing. And um, we let them you know, make their choices about um, what to do with their lives. Uh, so I have like one minute left. So now I'm just going to show you some animals. Uh, this is uh, this is the national park. It's their it's like their Yellowstone. It's their flagship national park. And look at that picture. That's a waterfall back there. And um, 
basically we're helping them to restore their national park, um, to create permanent jobs for them and to protect their environment. And uh, that's it, so thank you very much.